Hello there, I'm Phil Allen with a special report from Corning, Iowa, the headquarters of the National Farmers Organization. The Corning Chamber of Commerce held a special recognition luncheon for Oren Lee Staley, who is stepping down as president of the NFO. His resignation had come earlier in the same week when the NFO National Board met. Staley was honored by the Corning Chamber of Commerce to express this rural community's appreciation for the 23 years the NFO has maintained its headquarters office in this southwest Iowa town. There were many reminiscences about the days when the NFO was first a storefront office and through the two decades that it has grown to its present position as hub of a nationwide structure. The NFO headquarters has brought some 180 families to this community and provided jobs for others who already were residents of Corning. In his response, Staley talked about some of the early days in Corning and recalled old times with Harry Grundman, a Corning insurance executive who was an early day NFO president and was the first national vice president. Austin Turner of Corning is the nephew of the late Dan Turner, who was a Republican governor of Iowa during the 1930s, just before the New Deal. Austin Turner also spoke at the Corning meeting and recalled with Staley how Governor Turner helped organize the then infant NFO. Now, Turner praised Staley for the battles he has waged as NFO president against powerful forces. In his response, Staley explains a point that has been the subject of reporters' questions about why he stepped down as NFO president. He talks about the Des Moines meeting for action late last summer. But it goes back to August 3rd. When I said very clearly to 10,000 people there that the systems and structure of NFO are ready, that we brought in the professional people and know how the best there is in dairy, hogs, cattle, and grain, and our members are getting the best prices available to farmers. I said that several of us want to know, I'm speaking primarily Orrin Lee Staley, that whether or not support is going to become, come rapidly, <clears throat> overwhelming support to be able to reach the goals by the 1st of March. And if the farmers aren't going to give that support, we want to know so we can go back to our own farm. Following Staley's address, the new NFO president was introduced. Devon Woodland, he has served for eight years as vice president of the National Farmers Organization. Woodland is from Blackfoot, Idaho. He responded to another question many news reporters have asked, whether the NFO headquarters will remain in Corning. Here's Woodland's response. My family called shortly after they were aware of the change. And the little five-year-old boy, I'd been uh, talking to him on the phone nearly every night, and uh, he'd say, where are you, Dad, and what are you doing? And I'd say, well, I'm at the office in Corning, Iowa. And uh, he remembered that phrase, Corning, Iowa, and he sent me a letter. When are we going to move to Corny Island? <laughs> well, let me assure you of this, that my roots are in the West. I have to talk my family out of coming to the Midwest nearly every time I go home. Uh, the office is in the ideal environment where it ought to be and will stay. So we want to put your minds at ease about any major dramatic changes that are going to take place. It's not going to happen. The goals were established. We're where we are because of those goals. And we're going to pursue those goals right here with you. And there's nothing better than friends on your left and your right, behind you and in front of you. And thank you. Devon Woodland of Blackfoot, Idaho, is the new president of the National Farmers Organization after eight years in the vice presidency. He took over late in January when the NFO National Board announced the resignation of Oren Lee Staley, who had been president of the NFO for 23 years. This is the first visit we've had a chance to have with Devon Woodland since he became president of the NFO. Uh, first, Devon, I understand you've been getting phone calls. Yes, Phil, we've been getting phone calls from uh, all the areas of the United States, uh, from California onto the East Coast, from people that we haven't heard from since 1968. 
these people are saying, all right, now let's stop pointing fingers at each other and let's get on with the job. Uh, get back to uh, the goals of the organization, recommit ourselves to reach those goals. And so it's encouraging now that NFO is going to be a melting pot for all farmers and ranchers, regardless of uh, the background they have had with NFO, regardless of the organizations that they have now uh, been involved in, that we're going to, uh, we're going to blend them all together and uh, circle collective bargaining and zero in on those goals which is to someday establish our right to price and establish farm markets at the farm level. Why don't you review what the NFO's goals are? Well, our goals were established back in the 50s, as you know, and that was to uh, be the source of agriculture markets, to uh, set up our own system that would serve farmers, and those goals are going to be pursued uninterrupted. The uh, programs that we now have are going to be continued without any interruptions. We're just going to do more of what we're doing because we have now fine-tuned the uh, programs to where they will serve the farmers and ranchers. We have now uh, have the uh, professional people who are supervising and giving directions to these departments and these programs, and I'm convinced in my mind, Phil, that we're ready. The organization has everything we need. Uh, with exception of more commodity, which is uh, the strength and power we have, hence we call it farm power. Uh, we were there, the NFO News Department, when the NFO National Board had the meeting when Orrin Lee stepped down and you took over as president of the NFO. You said something at that meeting which I think is quotable, and I'd like to have you go over it again, if you would. You said the, you wouldn't have taken on this responsibility if you didn't think it was achievable. Well, it's a real challenge, and I've never seen a challenge like this in my lifetime, and I don't suppose uh, very many people will be faced with such a challenge. But I accept the challenge, fully realizing the responsibilities that go with it. And if I were to think for a second that we could not achieve the goals of this organization, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have accepted the challenge. I'm convinced we can. I wouldn't want to be associated with or have my name associated with... Uh, uh, not being able to reach a goal. But in my mind, uh, I'm firmly convinced that we can make NFO fly and that it's going to take uh, the cooperation of not only the uh, members in the areas, but it's going to take uh, a lot of uh, unity within the staff, and we have that. We have had total uh, transfer of loyalty uh, from the staff to the, uh, the organization we have recommitted ourselves to those original goals, and so, Phil, I'm convinced that uh, we can make it work, uh, and I'm excited about it, uh, because uh, a challenge always causes you to reach deep down and pull from things that uh, you've never exercised before, and this is what we're doing, and uh, a year from now, we're going to talk about uh, some of the problems we now have and how we whipped them. That's Devon Woodland, president of the National Farmers Organization. We had this visit, the first interview with him since he became an FO president. Woodland emphasized that the established goals, contracts based on cost of production plus a reasonable profit, are being pursued without interruption. Incidentally, Devon Woodland has an excellent track record. He was one of NFO's best organizers, even before he became vice president eight years ago. We had a conversation recently with Walt Hackney, director of the cattle division of the National Farmers Organization. He had appeared as special guest on a radio talk show, so in this interview I just echoed the questions most frequently asked. The first question reflects the concern many people have for the consumer in these days of high food prices. The biggest question I get uh, from the consumer is when will this uh, uh, erratic rise and fall of the m food prices on a retail level stop. Why can't agriculture stabilize their products as the steel industry has, as the automotive, automotive industry has, or the oil producing uh, industry? My answer to that is this simple. Those products in agriculture, uh, specifically those edible products that are retailed through the supermarkets, will be stabilized when agriculture wakes up and organizes themselves as the various other industries have that are in a stabilized position. It occurs to me, Walt, that it might make some of the processors a bit more honest, too, if agriculture could say, 
yeah, these are our costs, and this is the stability we've brought to it. It uh, not only would make them more honest, Phil, it would be a tremendous tool for them to use in selling the processed product that they buy from example cattle feeders. Uh, they could come out and on a contractual basis they could buy their product that they're going to be dispersing back to the retailers uh, three to five months in advance if they knew that this announced price was going to be acceptable and if they knew that it was within a tolerance of what it physically was going to bring they could buy their fixed amount of volume they need to slaughter to honor their labor requirements and etc and it would make a much better rapport between the processing industry and the physical agricultural producer is there an advantage to the processor say the packer in working with an organized supplier oh very definitely a tremendous advantage uh, the processor lives and breathes in these modern times on a specialized product. Now, when he has to go to the rural areas and procure cattle, as an example, uh, five head here and 10 head there and 150 head there, buying all classes, weights, and descriptions of cattle, these arbitrarily then affect his ability to specialize in a specific product. It also then definitely adversely affects his ability to sell a specialized type product to the consumer. Now, if he had the ability to come to the National Farmers Organization, as an example, and if in fact every m Monday morning we have 200 head of a specialized weight and classification of steers, we have 500 head of a specialized type and weight of dairy cow, and so forth, we could then tell them precisely what we have in an accumulated block basis, pre-sorted, pre-arranged the delivery for the processor, and ship them to those processors that actually specialize in those respective styles and weights of that particular commodity. So it would be more efficient for him and that would be more profitable for the organized farmer? Oh, very definitely. One head, as an example, has absolutely no clout on the marketplace at all. But if that one head is combined with those other organized producers and in fact becomes one of 200 of a specific kind, then all of a sudden it's of a volume that is very significant to a respective processor and they're willing to pay a premium price for that volume. That was Walt Hackney, head of the NFO Cattle Division. He speaks at town and country gatherings wherever the cattle industry is, including a guest appearance recently on a Wisconsin radio talk show. I'm Phil Allen for the National Farmers Organization, and that for today is something to think about. <laughs>